So what would our faith look like if it was not a religion? And what would our faith look like with the symbols of religion gone? What would it be like if we really understood the symbols for what they are and adjusted our living for it? it may not seem important, but it affects the very core of who we are, how we live, and what we expect God to do for us. And yes, it's another issue that needs to be talked about for the church to come into its maturity. You're watching The Prophetic Edge. Hi, my name's Don Norai. I'm here again with my partner in crime, Ruben Egoff. Hello. And today we're gonna talk specifically about not just any symbol of our faith, right. but we're gonna talk about the one that can be the most controversial. Yes, the cross, we just spoke about this, Don and I just spoke about this just recently, and the cross is not a pretty place. It's not. And it is a, it's a bloody place, it's, it's not one that, um, that we would celebrate as something nice because of what happened there in the conflict of the ages. And I think what has happened is when it comes to the symbol of the cross, it's a word that comes to my mind is a desensitizing. And when we desensitize something, it loses its effect. And when I, when I say the word desensitizing, just like at one point in our American culture, uh, murders and killings on the movies and so forth was not uh, like it is today in every scene. At one time, people cringed when they saw it, but because of the repetition of seeing it, we become desensitized by the murdering and the killing to the point now that human life doesn't seem to hold the same value. And I think similarly, when it comes to the symbol of the cross, I think we have experienced a similar reaction of desensitizing to the effect of what really took place there and in our lives. And how that affects us is very important. Yes. Because you know, we see uh, crosses on top of buildings, we wear crosses around our neck, we got fancy crosses with flowers all over them, and you know, we, we, do, uh, we do so many cool things cool things to the cross, to make it a piece of jewelry, to make it a centerpiece for the table, that we forget the suffering that took place on it. Mm. And you know, Protestants are really quick to nail the Catholics for keeping Jesus nailed to the cross on their crucifix. We say, my God rose from the dead. Well, you know what, he did rise from the dead, but he also suffered. And I, I, I'm not in favor of crucifixes, but I'm becoming less and less in favor of crosses as well. Here's what happens. We forget the suffering that Jesus went through, and what that does for us is that we make it seem as though we don't have to suffer. Mm. Jesus suffered, he paid it all, he took it all, so we're free. Well, Jesus paid it all, yes, and he took away all our sin, yes, but it doesn't free us from the sufferings that we have to go through in order to come in to the fullness of who God made us to be. And even Paul said at one point, he said all, he didn't say some, all that would live godly would suffer. He said they yeah. shall suffer. Shall and suffer. Jesus himself even spoke as well about picking up our cross daily and following him. And really what does, and I ministering recently is on that as well, and from many of our own conversations on this subject, and what does that really mean? And many times we think of, see this where this desensitizing to the power of the cross or the, the actual happening there and the suffering, is that we make today, I bear my cross as putting up with a bad relative. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or, 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 well, this is my cross as putting up with somebody that I work with who's not pleasant. The fact of the matter is though, that, that is not what picking up your cross is. Right. 
Right. It's much, much, much deeper as an experience. Yes, it's, it, it is the experience of me picking up the cross is allowing inner transformation. Mm. I don't put up with somebody. That is not my cross. My cross is coming into a place of forgiveness to that person. Mm. That's the cross. That's the inner transformation. It's dying to my pride or dying to my impatience or t t dying to my anger uh, at a particular person or a situation or a politician. When at the end of the day, the purpose of the cross in me is to transform me into the image and likeness of Christ himself. That's where, in, 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 is this, and just what you're saying is, instead of putting up with a bad relative or the co-worker as our cross. But I see it as, as just what you're saying and alluding to is every time God's will crosses my will. <laughs> wow, that's good. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. now, now there's this uh, conflict or this tension or this, you know, whatever is happening here. Now it's like Jesus said, well, okay, it's not my will, but thine be done which is another interesting point because that means that Jesus, <laughs> well, I don't want to go off the cliff here, but this is scripture. Okay. Jesus said, not my will. So then that tells me his will differed from that of the father at that moment. And at that moment, he had a decision to make. And that decision was made, no, I will come into alignment yes. with my father. That so many times is where us, every time where, where that, intersection takes place, there's my cross. See, what, 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 what we don't talk about is that issue of dying daily, it is that issue of daily surrender. As long as we're going to services, as long as we're praying every day, as long as we're reading our Bible, we're, we don't smoke, drink, spit, or chew, or date girls who do. Who date that's girls that's that do. That's uh, <laughs> uh, then, then we're okay. Mm -hmm. But that is an absolute surface level of Christianity. It still lets me harbor hate, resentment. It lets me break laws. It lets me deceive, cheat, intimidate. It lets me do all the things that human nature loves to do to get its own way. Mm. But on the surface, everything's perfect. I even wear the cross. What we need to do is stop wearing the cross and start bearing the cross. Yeah, yes. We have to start letting the cross, letting the death of the old man happen as I repent. As I, you know, even Jesus said this, and this is something else that sounds like it's going off the cliff. I don't understand it completely, but it's there. The scripture says Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. He learned obedience, learned obedience. He learned. So that means he was disobedient or he had to force himself to obey. What does that mean? He learned obedience through the things he suffered. I think through the, the suffering, uh, that experience of obedience and learning it, it, obedience in his growth through the things that he Wait suffered. Wait he had to grow? The Bible even says, just like John the Baptist, there's almost two mirrored verses where when it says John the Baptist that he grew in, in stature and in wisdom. Yeah, but the he was the son of God. But it says the same thing about Jesus. It also says that Jesus grew in stature and in wisdom. So therefore, that growing process was a part of Christ, his life as well. Though he remained sinless, we obviously know that. But though he all, but he had to grow, he had to mature. So this, back to that interesting verse. So wait a minute, so first, so if that had to happen to him, certainly it has to be us. <laughs> Exactly. Certainly, his will is going to cross my will, and I've got a decision to make as whether I'm going to surrender to his will or just be satisfied with that surface Christian life. The pinnacle, the pinnacle of maturity, you think about this. As we're talking about Jesus Christ, he grew in stature physically, and he grew and wisdom in his, his mind and et cetera. 
But when he came to the end of his life, the end of his life, he still, at the end of his life, at that intersection, not my will. There was a conflict there, not that, not that he was rebelling, but there was a difference between his will and the Father's at that moment. The ultimate test of maturity then was, when you will submit to the Father willingly, though you know it's going to cost you your life. So here's the question. Don't throw nothing at me. But why did the Father let the Son endure three hours of agonizing suffering? Why didn't he, okay, he's on the cross, boom, he's dead. Why did he have to suffer three hours of agonizing pain? Because every second he had to say, not my will, but your will be done. See, Jesus could have called in angels. They were there. They were waiting. Yes. They didn't understand. They had to come in a heartbeat. He could have been off that cross and back at the throne of God. But he didn't. Right. He could have stopped at, at, any, at any point. And here, here he was. He had three hours where every second he had to say, not my will, but your will be done. I mean, he, he, he didn't rebuke the devil. He didn't curse the Romans. Right. He didn't blame, he didn't blame anybody. It was, it's what he had to do. We start to suffer a little bit, and we get on Facebook and ask the prayer chain to get busy. Oh, pray for me. I don't feel good today. Or pray for me. This is happening. Pray for me. That's happening. And, and we don't understand the purpose of suffering. Right. Because we, we have cleaned up the cross. We've cleaned up the suffering. We've, we, we pulled out the nails and we've taken the blood off of it. And, and we made it into gold or silver or a nice finished mahogany thing that we can hang around our neck and we don't understand that that stands for the death not only of my Lord but it stands for my death mm -hmm. Paul said his suffering made up what was lacking in the sufferings of Christ yes this is and we said this the, uh, a week ago I think it was we was talking and, and I, re I never forget an individual saying one time that wearing a cross around your neck it's equivalent that we would not, in some cultures of the world doesn't use this, but in America we had used the electric chair as the means of death for uh, a, execution. A, execution and a murderer and so forth. And that's a, obviously is a gruesome experience and if you see it and, and forbid that you would have to see it. But anyway, nobody, the bottom line is, but nobody walks around with an electric chair in mahogany or, in, yeah, or, or a so, guillotine from the or, Middle Ages. Or, well, you can take it back to a guillotine. Let's put a guillotine in the top of our churches instead of a cross. Or it'd never do it. You're right. Right. Because, and in, in, in obviously why, the electric chair, the guillotine is because the, the, the repercussion of that is, oh my goodness, we are aghast at the, the, the experience that that was. It's gruesome. It was, it was you know, bad, whatever. The, but the cross was even more than that. Yes. The cross was when, beyond that. The Son of God dies on that cross. But we die on that every day. The Romans killed tens of thousands tens of people of thousands. through crucifixion. And we, and we hang out around our neck. No, I don't love the cross. I don't. I don't revere the cross. It's not the holy symbol. It is the symbol of how the world system how the flesh of man crucified my king. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not something I revere. I revere him who endured the cross. I revere him who now sits at the right hand of the Father in my heart. That's who I reveal. See, it, it, it was the blood of Christ that took us from our Egypt. Yes. But it's our blood that takes us from our wilderness. Ex explain that because when we when we were talking before when you when Jesus Christ died and we he brings us out of Egypt 
and we, we walk out, he frees us through that, the, the appearance of the baptism in the Red Sea, and away we go. But when they come to that Jordan, there's something different now. Yes, yes. Now the requirement is you better die to yourself. Yes. See, uh, I, as I have said many times, who didn't want to leave Egypt? Who wouldn't want to risk leaving Egypt? You know, they, were, they, they made bricks. Their kids died young. They died young. They were slaves. They were whipped. They were ill-fed, ill-clothed. They lived in shacks. Sometimes I look at the... Uh, uh, you know, watch that old Charlton Heston movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, and the, the scene they set up was too nice. Right. You know, those right. houses and huts. No, that's not. The, the, it was absolute horror the way they lived. Who didn't want to leave Egypt? Who didn't want to walk away from Egypt? Who didn't want to uh, leave that behind? Certainly they would do that. So the, the, they, uh, the sacrifice... Of, of the lambs protected them. It was the sacrifice of the lamb that uh, finally brought the Egyptians to the place where they let Egypt, uh, they let Israel leave. Mm -hmm. But then you're right, to get into the promised land, something completely different. Something really changes. Yes. Because now you're going from horrific conditions in Egypt, now you're living in total supply. Yes. Total, total food, nourishment, total clothing, miraculous, everything. shelter, everything. Yes. Who wants to leave that? Yeah. <laughs> right. Nope. And when God says, when God says, go to possess that land, right away, here comes another cross experience, is the conflict, why do I want to do that? Why do I want to cross over there when I really have it good here? Yes. Heck no, I'm not going over there. I got bread and water and my clothes grow and <laughs> you know, I got a fi fire keeping me warm at night and a pillar of smoke by day. I don't have to figure out where to go. I just follow the cloud. Right. I just, I, I, don't, I don't need to do nothing, man. Now God's requiring us inconvenience now. Yes. Now he's requiring us cross the door. Now you're gonna have to fight. Now you're gonna have to- But to what was the goal? The goal was the kingdom would be established. Yes. See, it, 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 in the wilderness, there was no kingdom establishment. There was no growth of wealth. There was no way to create wealth. But for the king to be established, see, in, in Israel, in, in Egypt, and in the wilderness, God knew that they were his children. Mm-hmm but it would take moving into uh, Canaan for them to discover that God was their father. Talk about Africa on that because that really hit me like a ton of bricks because when we're speaking here in Africa and wilderness and now going into the promised land, just like you're saying, it's time now to go and possess. Well, it, it, it Africa has been experiencing a wilderness experience, so to speak, when it comes to the supply they get from the West. They're just totally dependent upon the West. Mm -hmm. or, uh, they will do anything to get supplied from the West. They'll do anything to get what they, what, what they need or, or, or what they're able to, to get. But this, this with Africa, when, it's, when, it's in the, when we're in the wilderness, and then looking at the West, but now it's time to transition and go into the promised land. What does that, I wanted you uh, to kind of talk because I know it's really on your heart. Yes, Africa is equivalent to Canaan. They have everything they need to rule and reign, not only in their own life, not only in their own continent, but they have what it takes to save the world. Mm -hmm. They can feed the world, they can supply the world with minerals, they can lead the, role, the world in Christian faith and holiness and, and, and the ethics of Christianity. They have everything they need to do that with, but they are 
but Africa has been so subservient to the West that they forgot their own destiny. Mm. And Africa has an amazing destiny. Yes. Africa has an amazing purpose in God's heart. You don't even have to be a prophet to see it. It is a rich, the continent is rich. It has everything in that continent. They can feed the world. They can supply the world with the most, uh, w w with the most rare of metals. The, everything in Africa is so plentiful. But because Africa has been pillaged and controlled and ruled by so many other nations for so long, they forgot who they are. Mm. And they are a mighty people. Africa, you're a mighty people. You are a great people. God's got great plans for you. And uh, Africa doesn't have to rule by deceit. They don't have to rule by control or intimidation. They don't have to rob from one another. They don't have to do any of that because the king is within them. So their lives, once they allow the king to transform them, that's what happens in, the, in Canaan. You know, people think going from the wilderness to Canaan is the end. It's not an end. It's a new beginning. Because <laughs> in the wilderness, there was no transformation occurring. They were just maintaining. But it's only when they crossed into Canaan that they were able to deal with the enemies that p prevented them from ruling and reigning their land. Mm -hmm. So crossing into Canaan is, a be is the new beginning, not an end. And that's where Africa is right now. It is at a new beginning. And some will have to hear it. Some will hear God. Some will hear that it's time to surrender, that it's time to let Christ reign within them. No matter what it costs, they'll die daily. They'll die moment by moment. You know, they'll say it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Well, if Christ lives in you, Christ isn't a thief. He isn't a murderer. He isn't an adulterer. <laughs> right. He isn't a warmonger. He is one who rules through love, compassion, hope, peace, strength. And that force, that power of his presence, you know, if you can't, being able to wield the power of God but not having the character of God within you changes nothing. Exactly. The kingdom is within. The kingdom, there's no such thing as kingdom signs. I just saw a new book, Kingdom Signs and Wonders. There's no, there's no signs and wonders to the kingdom. The kingdom comes without observation. The kingdom comes in me when I am changed, when I am transformed, when I allow Christ to rule and reign within me that is the kingdom of God. And then you see the power of God flowing. Well, I think, I think it all begins with we ourselves should be a sign and wonder. Yeah. We, we ourselves should be the, the proverbial billboard of God's... <laughs> Humility and mercy <laughs> yes. and yes. peace. Yes, and I think, I think that keeps us from okay, always chasing the signs and chasing all of those things. And why do we do that? Do we need validation? Do we need to be validated that we're sons of God or something? What, what does that do for me well, when in relationship I should be that? Well, it is because when there's no internal validation going on, I have to see this. Well, I, I have miracles happen in my life. I must be in God's will. No. The, the, the scripture says that God took care of Israel because they were his sons, but they were disobedient. In, in, in the wilderness, they experienced the miracles, but they were disobedient. The issue is being free to live a life of fruitful holiness that comes through dying daily. By facing the cross and letting the same cross that brought about our salvation through Christ, that same process, conform us into his image so that that which is in heaven can be seen through us on earth. Yes. It's a new definition of the cross, and it's a definition that says, I must bear the cross, not just wear the cross. 
You've been watching The Prophetic Edge. Thank you, Ruben. Sure. And we'll see you the next time. My latest book, The Forgotten Mountain, is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important books I've written because it deals with the ultimate authority in the land. Everybody likes talking about the seven mountains and how we need to pursue the seven mountains and overtake the seven mountains and rule and have authority in them. But from what I hear from missionaries and pastors, especially outside the United States, is that the seven mountains mandate doesn't seem to be working. That no matter how much money, time, or effort is put into it, there seems to be the inability to bring it to pass. Now, I took this to the Lord and I said, Lord, what is this all about? Because the, you know, the, the Seven Mountains mandate is a very concise and clear, clear project that we could pursue. <clears throat> and I heard the Lord say to me, you have forgotten another mountain. And uh, the, the scripture from Micah came up to me immediately. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall become the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. Now, without getting into a big, long Bible study, I want to talk to you about the book, The Forgotten Mountain, because that's what this study is all about. And it's more than a study. It's, it's more like an adventure, a story that shows you how the forgotten mountain is the authority of God, and that authority is within me. See, you can't talk about the kingdom of God without a king. You can't talk about the power of what God wants to do inside of us if you're not dealing with the fact that this mountain has to be conquered first. So this is the book. This is The Forgotten Mountain. And I encourage you to pick it up. You're going to discover how the mountain of the house of the Lord in you ultimately becomes the chief mountain. Once you are conquered, you can conquer any other mountain you try to face. Pick this up on Amazon and my website, any place online, any place books are sold. The Forgotten Mountain. Thanks a lot. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the show today. Listen, we really love to hear from you. Any comments, suggestions, questions that you give us, either positive or negative, are really helpful to us. So, listen, don't be afraid to tell us your opinion. Please email either myself or or Ruben Egoff and we may even end up answering your question on one of our future shows so take a minute write to us and we really appreciate it thanks mm -hmm.